For our final session tonight, I'd like to call Nitine Gokhale with Brigadier Sanjay Agarwal on the stage to discuss on the very important topic beyond NJ9842, the Seachan Saga. Please give it a round of applause. Welcome, gentlemen. Please take your seat. Nitine Gokhale is a media entrepreneur, one of South Asia's leading strategic affairs analyst and author of all over half a dozen books so far on military history in search 11 books on military history, insurgencies, and wars. Starting his career in journalism in 1983, a specialist in conflict coverage, Gokhale has covered the insurgency in India's Northeast, the 1999 Kargil conflict, and Sri Lanka's fourth Elam war between 2006 and 2009. Now he travels across the globe to speak at seminars and conference and lecture at India's <coughs> sorry at India's premier defense college about the book the book in question about operation Mag Magdhut, which was launched by the Indian army on the barren and icy heights of Siachen glacier to thwart Pakistan from gaining control of this strategically located glacier for three decades since then, India and Pakistan troops have been locked in an undeclared war on world's highest and coldest battlefield. As the discussion for this session, we are fortunate enough to have Brigadier Sanjay Agarwalji. He is former security advisor to the Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, advisor to the government of Seychelles, a country in East Africa, advisor to National Highway Authority of India, and the President of Service Selection Board, Ministry of Defence, Government of India. He is a master trainer in soft skills with ICAI, the Institute of Chartered Accountant of India. He speaks on TV on international geopolitics, security issues, etc. Over to you, gentlemen. Thank you. So finally, we have Mr. Nitin Gokhale with us. Many of you would have seen him. If you saw him eight years ago, he was in NDTV. And thereafter, he started off on his own. And I must say that he has created a very valuable and respectable niche for himself with his own YouTube channel. He has authored his books. And this book on Siachen was published in April 2014. You will remember that the story of Siachen started after 1971 when Pakistan was fragmented into two and then it started a cartographic aggression of sorts, started sending mountaineering expeditions into what was clearly Indian territory, nobody was there from either side, etc. It Operation Meghdoot, the official start of the Siachen Saga per se, the date officially is 13th April 1984. And I was there at that time. I got my second gallantry award from the President of India for the capture of a Pakistani force there. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The point I want to make here, which Nitin will cover after this, he'll give a detailed opening address. I'll have a few questions and then questions from the audience. So the point I've tried to make here is, April 1984, it started, and the book was published in April 2014, 30 years later. So this is something Nitin will throw light on, and then we will discuss further after his opening remarks. Over to you. Thank you very much. I have a small uh, PowerPoint like uh, the previous author here. And because uh, without that, you will not get an idea of what uh, Siachen is all about. Uh, so, no, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'll just do it like this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Next. 
So this is the cover of the book. Uh, can I have that book? So the originally, this book was published like this in hardback uh, with the, this cover. Uh, the uh, back cover you see is a, uh, is a snow uh, pillar on which small helicopters like Cheetah and Chetak land uh, for uh, supplies and uh, for evacuating people from there. Anyway, next please. So uh, why is Siachen important? It's important to know geographically and therefore this map. If you see this, uh, if you see this map here, uh, the LOC ends at NJ9842. And uh, from there, th that is NJ9842, uh, when the agreement was signed uh, in 1949 and then in 1972. But Siachen is uh, beyond this, uh, the Saltoro Ridge, as you can see, Saltoro Kangri. Pakistan occupied Kashmir or Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir is on the west of Saltoro Kangri and Siachen is on the east of the Saltoro Ridge. So Pakistan started sending expeditions like he said from uh, Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir into Siachen because it also gives access to Karakoram Pass in China. Now cartographically, classically when you uh, do uh, maps, uh, the uh, line has to go along the watershed that means high ridges. But here, uh, one of the pioneers of Siachen operations, Colonel uh, Narendra Bull Kumar, a famous uh, military mountaineer, he did a German expedition in 1979 with the Germans, and he saw these maps, American maps, which showed the line uh, going, the LOC ending to uh, at Karakoram Pass. Effectively, it meant that Siachen would have gone into Pakistan, occupied Jammu and Kashmir. So when he uh, reported this to Army headquarters and to Northern Command, the then uh, officers there uh, who were uh, part of the Northern Command, leading the Northern Command, they started sending our expeditions to those places and uh, said that cartographically that red line that you see should be the LOC which should be ending at Sia Kangri, right up there in the north. It should go because the language of the, uh, the uh, agreement between India and Pakistan said thence northwards from NJ9842. So therefore the book is called uh, Beyond NJ9842, the Siachen Saga. Anyway, next please. So uh, this is the Siachen Glacier. It's 70 kilometer long, uh, world's, one of the world's longest glaciers at the height of more than 20,000 feet. Uh, Sanjay would know because he was deployed there. Uh, it's all perpetually snowbound. Next please. Uh, why did I choose to do this? Because I reported on the Kargil War for Outlook magazine, picked up from Northeast and I was sent to uh, report Kargil. And one of the things that I uh, started understanding in Kargil, I was much younger then, uh, so uh, that time I started understanding that Kargil happened because General Parvez Musharraf wanted to take a revenge of Siachin, which he couldn't recapture. As, as a brigade commander, he wanted to capture Siachin, he couldn't recapture, and he wanted to cut off Siachin from rest of India. So Kargil happened. And uh, therefore, uh, Siachen remains an important uh, sort of starting point. I mean, the Kargil War remains an important starting point for me uh, when I first heard it when I went to Kargil. Next, please. So, uh, 2007 to 2013, when I joined NDTV in 2006, after spending 23 years in the Northeast, I started going to Ladakh more often, to Siachen base camp, to Siachen, to Kumar base. And I started going to Pangangso, which you see now in the news. But I started going, this is, a, this is a boat, army patrol boat on Pangangso. Next, please. This is the Changla Pass uh, in, uh, in Ladakh, which is also in the news now. And this is where I'm pointing to a Chinese vehicle coming into Pangangso, where you see the finger areas and all that, which has now become very famous. All this is between 2007 and 2013. Then suddenly, I got... Uh, to know that the uh, operation had began on 13th April 1984. So I said, you know, this is the 30th anniversary coming up. So in September 2013, I decided to write this book. And in six months, start to finish uh, research, uh, travel to the, uh, to the uh, ground, and then writing the book, it exactly took me five and a half months, and we published it and launched it on 13th April 1984, which is the 30th anniversary of the Operation Megdut. This is in the base camp uh, where the uh, uh, soldiers are being trained. Go, go ahead. So I started reviving. Now this is 
Uh, the base camp is uh, from Leh. It is about uh, seven hours journey, uh, the Siachen base camp. Go ahead, please. I am just showing you photographs, nothing else. Please go ahead, next. So this is the Siachen battleground where training is done of the soldiers who go up and deploy at the heights of 22,000 feet and beyond, and sometimes uh, around that much. Next, please. Next. So I started traveling to Ladakh. This is my wife, my perpetual companion for the last 34 years. Uh, so we were in uh, Ladakh and in, uh, in the Kargil area and then Siachin. Next, please. This is the Thois base from where uh, troops are taken from Delhi uh, on chartered flights. Jet Airways no longer exist, but that is a Jet Airways flight at Thois Air Base, where they directly fly to Thois, which is close to the Siachin base camp, and from there they start climbing after acclimatizing themselves. Next, please. So it, why did it happen? I had had no plans, but I met somebody who had started the operation on 13th April 1984. Then, then Major General Sanjay Kulkarni, who was the first Indian officer leading a men of, uh, I mean, platoon of 30 people, being airdropped on a, one of the passes on the Saltoro Kangri. And he mentioned that, you know, we started, and it was a very secretive operation. It's still an ongoing operation, by the way. Operation Meghdoot is still an ongoing operation. It hasn't ended. It is Indian Army's longest running operation in that sense. So on, uh, how they went, he started telling me the story. I said, okay, now I must write this story. So that's how it began. And uh, this is Leh. Uh, next, please. Just go, quick, quickly keep going. So that is where we went to the base camp, talked to the people, and you know, started uh, gathering information of how is it to be deployed there. Is it physically challenging? Is it mentally exhausting? All that started happening, and this is the war memorial uh, in Siachin base camp. Next, please. I think the final uh, thing. So I got down to business in writing, uh, started meeting people. Uh, so here I'm meeting a soldier who has just come down from being deployed uh, at the height of 24,000 feet. He's come down. So one of the anecdotes I just want to tell you, uh, and very quickly, I asked him, what kya dikkat hai hoti hai? He's from a two Bihar regiment. So he said, sir, kuch nahi, wahan pe to heated tents hai, abhi to bahut achha hai. This is 2013, nearly 30 years after the operation was launched. Much has changed, much comfortable. But one thing is that there are 13 cities for making chawal. So his basic thing was that he was not getting the chawal to eat. So uh, that's what he said. Then these are the pilots, the one of the bravest people you will get in this world, in the military, who uh, operate beyond the flight envelope of the helicopters, which are meant to go to at about 20,000 feet. But they go up to 22, 23, 24,000 feet at that blizzard that happens uh, in the snowbound, and that's the kits that these people carry. Next, please, and I think one of the last uh, few things are that are there. So I started meeting the people who were responsible in the beginning to launch Operation Meghdoot. Uh, in the gentleman in the gray is uh, Lieutenant General uh, M.L. Chipper, who uh, is the man with the cap here after 30 years. He retired in 1984 uh, after doing this operation, and then I met him in 2013 with Brigadier Channa on the right, who is there in the picture is the, uh, the man with the specs. Uh, in the middle picture, if you can see, uh, left of uh, the, uh, the general. So I, I got them together, uh, thanks to Brigadier Channa, and then they started recounting the story. Next, please. So it started, uh, the uh, pace started gathering. This is Sanjay Kulkarni, then Captain Sanjay Kulkarni, retired as Lieutenant General, next please. Le le retired as Lieutenant General Sanjay Kulkarni. You can see the same tilt of the head. Uh, and this is uh, the Colonel Bull Kumar on the left, uh, the army, then Army Chief in 1981-82, uh, General T. N. Raina. This is Bull Kumar, a famous mountaineer who just passed away last year. Uh, and he was like this. I sat with him in Somvihar in Delhi to get all the details from him of how it started off. And uh, then uh, next, so quickly, uh, so uh, as I announced the project, People started coming up with their memories, their photographs. Quick, just keep going. Some of these old photographs, which are actually from personal collection of uh, my friends in the army, in the military, in the air force, in the army. They started sharing their photographs, their stories. Just quickly go. The hard part was to get uh, you know, the uh, details of the operations. And like Sanjay will tell you, it is a secret operation. You're not supposed to tell everything. But I, I couldn't get everything. 
So whatever I got, I put it in the book. So many people have complained to me later that this is not a complete book. And including my, me, including which I will him. cover. So uh, my point is, it's not an official history. It's, it's just a storytelling. Next, please. Next. So uh, we just kept sifting through what happened. Um, so this is the difficulty. Look at the small toy-like uh, helicopter at 22, 22,000, 23,000 feet. That's a snow scooter which came much later. Uh, next, please. So there are medical problems. This gentleman, this is, he's a porter. He lost three limbs because he went into the crevasse uh, there. But the army uh, restored his limbs and today uh, he runs a PCO in, uh, in uh, Ladakh, in Leh. Uh, that's how the army takes care of even the people who are not part of the army officially. Next, please. So there are medical saviors who actually are like uh, somebody, one uh, person said to me, he's no longer alive, uh, died very young, uh, uh, CEO of that two Bihar regiment. He said, sir, here, Hepter, Doctor and Porter are our gods. Hepter is the helicopter, Porter is the porter that I showed you with uh, three legs, uh, three limbs having been lost and the doctor. Without them, they cannot survive in Siachen. Next, please. So, one more thing that keeps them going is OP Baba. Om Prakash, one soldier who died one day, now comes into everybody's dreams apparently. And unless you pray to him before you go up and you pray to him after you come back, your tenure is not complete. It's not considered successful. So it's OP Baba. You know, he's called uh, OP Baba and the faith is absolutely uh, unshakable there. Next please. So anyway, this uh, I've told you already what is the geopolitical compulsion. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It's no longer a bilateral issue, it's China. Just go ahead, just go to the next one because Sanjay has many other things to talk about. So uh, veterans, these are the people who helped me um, put the stories together. Uh, there are people from Air Force, there are people from Army, there are people from the Medical Corps of the Army. Next please. They're very, very generous uh, veterans. And uh, these are the people. General Malik wrote the foreword to the book. Uh, and then uh, Captain Bana Singh, honorary Captain Bana Singh, one of the three living Paramveer Chakra winners. And then, of course, uh, all the others. So I just want to end with what I think about the Indian soldier. And last final uh, thing will come here. Yeah. You can read it yourself. I think a, a salute to them is required. A, a round of applause to the soldiers. And not to me, I'm, I'm only an instrument in putting this all together. Thank you very much. This is the end of the PowerPoint presentation. So thank you, Nitin. I think he has made his terms of reference very clear. He has made his time frame crunch and its consequent limitations very clear. And I think as an author, he deserves nothing but praise for this great human interest story that he has told, vibrant, detailed, anecdotal evidences, backed up by photos. The professional crib is that there is only one weak, vague map, but then he has told you that he's doing it as a journalist with only what was made available to him. Also note that when he talks of the people that he has spoken to and in his book, there is none from my unit 19 Kumau. Now, I will cover for you, not as a criticism of the book, because that he has adequately said and the book is complete. There is certain other aspects that you need to know, because I'm afraid when you see these pictures of men in white, and you see snow scooters, and you see one-man chambers, the impression in the general public of India is that the army is well looked after. It is much better looked after today. It is very good. But in about 30 seconds, I do want to tell you, and I'm not talking of 1962, I'm talking of from April 1984 till August 1984 when I was there, and I incidentally hold a world record of sorts of staying at above 19,000 feet for 77 days consecutively. Because this is a post I captured and I had to stay there. So it's a world record of sorts because medically it is ill-advised. Nobody does it then or now. Now, the hardships. And here is the role of 19 Kumau. When we say that there was a battalion which went in, 
and as he has said, and he's written it in his book, I think it's on page 78, I don't remember. The company was less than a platoon strength. One officer, one JCO, 27 men. My battalion, 19 Kumao, went in as a full battalion and established a battalion headquarters at a place which today has become a base camp and a mini township. So when we went there, we had the clothing which you are given in, say, Shillong, or you're given in Leh. And with those areas, the bottoms of our trousers wore off. So what did we do? We never got new trousers. We wore shorts underneath, our PT shorts. And when they started wearing out, we stitched the short onto the trouser. When our shoes started, the soles were wearing, and we were on rock and ice. We put grass, and where did we get grass from? Because some of the packing material had straw. So we tied with wire straw on the sole of the shoe, and you change the plastic frequently, hoping that you don't get chillblain, leading to frostbite, leading to amputation of your toes. So I won't go into the stories of this, because I have refused for many channels, only for Netflix, when they pursued me for six months, because these memories are very painful. And I have refused authorships and co-authorships of the book. It's very painful. Emotionally, to see what, I don't want to remember. I have destroyed all photographs that I had. I am a photographer. I have over one lakh photographs, zero of Siachen. It's so painful. It's so painful. The biggest enemies, and this is common knowledge, number one, weather. Number two, your higher headquarters. And the last of the enemy was the Pakis. But the good part was that there was somebody when I said, damn it, I was in the Shikar Club in 1978. You get me a sniper rifle, I'll knock off a few. So somebody got me a sniper rifle. And it filtered down, and in a month I got it. An old 303. And only 50 rounds. So when the first time I had to zero the weapon and all that, I shot a guy. I was so elated. I'm not a trained sniper officially, but otherwise I'm a sniper. I was elated. And that's where my lack of training came in. And my heartbeat went. Another chap stepped down one step. Stepping down one step at 21,000 feet to get the thing up is a big thing. And the second chap I couldn't kill, I missed him. I hit him, I missed him. So I dutifully reported, two uh, there is one casualty. This was picked up by the radio intelligence, and they said, tell that boy to, con I was a boy, <laughs> tell that boy to convert his MMG into ACAC role, anti-aircraft role. Puma coming to rescue Captain Nabil Khan, Asghar force injured. That's when I came to know that this post that I have captured was earlier held by the Pakistani para-commandos. And Captain Nabil Khan has been injured. I had, and Captain, there is one fatal casualty and Nabil Khan is injured and the Puma is coming to rescue Nabil. I had reported one casualty, we don't know whether he's died. This is what established the reputation of 19 Kumau. But leave the 19 Kumau story aside. Now, he tells me that Brigadier Channa was his neighbor, etc. So the book largely is Channa's narrative. I have read every book published on this. I have chosen not to speak and write. This book is in gripping. Having said what I have, this book as a human interest story from the eyes of a journalist and a special word, he's shown it in his photographs, he has traveled the ground. So he is able to bring out the many small, small anecdotes Yes, there are many stories which have been consigned to the dustbins of history. That is unfortunate. Never mind. It doesn't take away from the goodness of the book. Now, Nitin, what would you like to tell our public and our audience who is watching us live about your feelings after you've written this book? Well, I mean, as I said, if I, if I can have that book and I want to read out uh, one very uh, important passage from here to uh, uh, the audience. When I said this uh, in the introduction, I said this book is not a definitive history of Operation Meghdoot. 
but it is certainly a slice of history seen through the eyes of those who had the opportunity to serve at Siachen. Some of those who had opportunity to serve at Siachen. I have no pretensions of being a military analyst either. I am a journalist who has had the privilege of being trusted by officers and men in the Indian military, a trust I value far more than anything else in my profession. And finally, a three decade long operation like Operation Meghdoot will have many untold stories. I have tried to capture as many as possible, but the list can never be complete. That is my failing, but read it for whatever it is worth. I still continue to maintain that, that it is not a complete story, but it is a story that will interest you because there are human elements in this. There is an experiment done by the medical corps of the Indian Army when one battalion of the Grenadiers was going from Rajasthan to get deployed in Siachen. Rajasthan, you have 50 degrees temperature. In Siachen, it can get to minus 60 degrees. So they, sent, they said, for whatever their duration of their deployment in Siachen and their journey, we will record their medical changes, physical, physiological and psychological changes that happen in the soldiers. And the soldiers came from different uh, stock, if you may want to call it that. They were Rajputs, Ahirs, uh, Muslims. It was, it was made up of uh, all kinds of uh, religion and uh, region, people from all, all religions and uh, region. So they studied this uh, general, uh, Major General Venu Nair that time, Velu Nair. He said that we will do this study for two years, they did this. And they came up with the answers for how different bodies react to different uh, situations and, uh, and the conditions at the highest level. So that is where uh, my satisfaction is that I could actually bring this to the notice of the people. People have written it before. General like V.R. Raghavan, who retired as uh, DGMO, he wrote it from a strategic perspective, from his military perspective. But nobody told, him, uh, told the audience how logistics is important. People say, uh, you know, amateurs discuss tactics and strategies. Professionals discuss logistics. How to get the ration there? How to get uh, the food to them? How to get medicines? How to evacuate uh, patients from there? That is what my satisfaction is all about. Absolutely. On this logistics thing, just one month ago, there's another gentleman who's writing a book. He's finished it and now it's being converted into a film. So he said, you know, I want your photograph of those times so that a suitable character can be found for the movie. So I sent him photographs of myself a year later and coincident a year earlier when I had gone for the Gorichen expedition, so I'm all bearded. And he said, Siachen, you had beards were allowed in the army. So I had to tell him by first name. I said, friend, we didn't have water to drink because we didn't have fuel to melt the ice. And you're talking of water to shave? And you've written a book on Siachen? I'm sorry. How can you understand that environment? Where I don't have water to drink. I have to suck ice as a popsicle, as a lollipop, to put enough water in. So logistics is the bane, and we are seeing it in Ukraine. Now, I want to ask you another issue the way things have panned out and the way things are standing today, where do you see the future of the Siachen imbroglio? Well, I think uh, you just heard uh, there was a question to the army chief just three months ago whether you would like to demilitarize Siachen. So as a professional soldier, he said, uh, certainly if uh, there are issues we can discuss, but until uh, the AGPL. AGPL is that Saltoro Ridge, the uh, actual ground position line, unless it is authenticated on the map and accepted by Pakistan, which Pakistan doesn't accept. So by the way, I want to tell this, uh, uh, the interested audience here, Pakistan's deployment is not on Siachen. So when they say we are on Siachen, Siachen is a dispute between India and Pakistan, that's a fallacy. They are west of the Saltoro Ridge, much below. So if this is the ridge, they are down there. They can't even see Siachen. If you look at the map, they can't see Siachen Glacier. But they have made themselves a party to Siachen. So therefore, to say that uh, we will withdraw and you will uh, withdraw and there will be demilitarization, I think is a fallacy. We should not accept that at all. We should just continue to stay where we are because it's geopolitically extremely important area. So this issue, 2012, 103 Pakistani soldiers were lost in an avalanche. And General Kayani said, we will do something to demilitarize it. 
And at one point, Mr. Manmohan Singh had said, this should be a mountain for peace. Nothing happened. What he said is right. Pakistan wants us to withdraw and thus create a demilitarized zone. And we have Mr. Sayyid Akbaruddin here, who is privy to a lot of the international narrative, right, wrong, false, motivated, whatever, on these issues at the UN. He's been having a ringside view and he's influenced narratives there. So those are the issues. But my question to you is, you are saying it will continue like this and be a festering sore. It is not a festering sore anymore in it my is. view. It is. There's an economic drain on our country. My, no, uh, for a country like India, three crores a day is of no drain, I would think. Uh, and we should not uh, just you know, think of in, in terms of cost. Because there is an additional factor in my view. I'm again not a soldier like you. But uh, at least I get the ringside view of uh, things that are happening. Today, China is also in the equation. And because uh, DBO and uh, the uh, Karakoram Highway is uh, to the east of uh, Siachen, uh, we have to take into this account, uh, take into account that we should not allow the handshake between Pakistan and China to take place above Siachen. And this is the Siachin, point I want to And the Siachen is the wedge between the two. Unless we hold, continue to hold Siachen, they will have a handshake, they will collaborate, they will collude. And they will, uh, in no time, I mean, al although it's very difficult in those circumstances or those, uh, that geography, but you cannot rule out the possibility of them then pressing or squeezing the Indian positions and Indian depth in Ladakh. So therefore, we should not never withdraw from Siachen. Now, I would like the audience to ask any kinds of questions. Please identify yourself. Yes, we have one. Sir, my name is Ashish Shakya. I'm a former under officer in NCC Bhopal. Well done. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I have one question since I have researched about the Siachen and uh, beyond that. Uh, I guess you know about the Belt and Road Initiative between India, uh, uh, China and Pakistan, right? Also, the string of pearls that China is actually offering with different nations so that it can, if any war happens in future with India, so it can conquer us from all the sides, from the mountainous regions also, as well as from the sea regions also. So what do you think India's best decision of not signing the BRI and also collaborating with other countries such as Singapore, Vietnam and Australia for that cross-border relationship and training exercises is, a, is the best decision taken by the Indian Army so far to conquering, uh, also to take care of the war in future if any situations like that happens? You answered so, your own question actually here, uh, because uh, India uh, said BRI is not a transparent uh, scheme or a transparent uh, project. It's not, a, uh, it's not an economic project, remember, it's a political project of China. Therefore, we have not joined it and uh, it passes through our, uh, our territory, POJK and uh, Gilgit-Baltistan. So that's one part of it. String of pearls is a much abused, much used uh, term. I, we can discuss it offline, uh, don't waste our, everybody's time here. But the fact is, India is also doing what it needs to do to uh, counter China in, uh, in Southeast Asia, in uh, Central Asia, and uh, many of these uh, regions where China is also trying to come into South Asia, has come into South Asia. So it's an ongoing game, and uh, it's a decision best taken in national interest. Interest, self-interest, like Mr. Akbaruddin said a little while ago, comes above principles. So I think India has taken those decisions rightly. So. Just to add on, since you appear to be well informed, 2017 has been a turning point in Indian projection of its core interests and in its internal reactions to core threats. Dokala, please don't refer to it as Dokalam, that's a Chinese terminology, Dokala. There were no rhetoric from India no politician loose statements. So we took a leaf out of somebody else's book. We were talking softly and trying to carry as big a stick that we could. And China blinked. So that is the turning point and what is happening today. And today at the helm of Indian foreign policy, you have a career diplomat. And if you see the equation between a difficult situation for India between US, India, Russia, India, it's happening wonderfully well. So I would say that 
we in India can rest assured that the Indian foreign policy and its execution is in safe hands today. Okay, next question, please. I would also request you to identify who you want it to be answered by. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a question? No, I don't think so. All right, then. Yeah, there is. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, this question is uh, for Nitin and for uh, Sanjay. Uh, I'm Bharat Vaklu. I'm just curious to understand that you did mention that uh, China and Pakistan are bound to collaborate more in the coming months, coming years. Do you really think that uh, that's something that's going to be sustainable over the long term? Because China is also in a state of flux. So what are your views on this collaboration? Well, I think uh, it, is, um, it is a given that uh, I, in fact, in my uh, uh, discussions and talks, I call uh, Pakistan uh, China's uh, whatever, 37, 38 province. Colony. Uh, yeah. Colony, whatever you want to call it. So uh, in that sense, they are deeply embedded. Uh, it cannot be decoupled. And they've called it, uh, you know, that famous saying about uh, deeper than the ocean, higher than the mountains, sweeter than honey, and stronger than steel is what the Chinese uh, said about their friendship with the Pakistanis. So it's not going to decouple so soon. Uh, it will, no matter what happens to the Chinese economy or slows down, it doesn't take much for uh, China to give uh, what they're giving it to Pakistanis in terms of military hardware and other uh, you know, help or economic um, aid that they give to Pakistan. So it's not going to happen in a hurry. That's, that's the bottom line. Do we have any other Okay, questions? so here China, for the general audience, just like the Pakistan army has a country to look after it, the only political party in China, the CCP, has a country to look after it. It's a big difference which a democracy like India doesn't understand. And therefore, it's a one party and Xi Jinping has ensconced himself and there's a litmus test coming up this year. Mr. Akbaruddin is nodding his head in agreement. The way I visualize this, that Pakistan will remain a proxy of China, the sovereignty angle will get diluted, influence of China will reign supreme, that is forgiven. The issue is, how best does India address this? But the Pakistan-China equation will remain close and get closer. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? All right, then we'd move on. I would like to <laughs> I would like to request Raghav Chandra, sir, director of the Society for Culture and Environment, to please come forward and felicitate the authors and the discussant with a memento of symbol of love, respect, and gratitude. Okay. Uh, Abhilash sir is the founding member of the Society of Culture and Environment. He will be presenting our guests with the memento of honor, love and gratitude. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful session.